and thanks to John and thanks to all the folks that made this happen. Um, it's my first time at the Institute, hopefully not the last. Um, I've, I've learned a ton, I've met some wonderful people, and this is a grand event. Thank you for having me. I'm going to talk about, I kind of expanded my title, so if you're reading off the program, I was supposed to talk just about strengths and well-being, um, but I decided, okay, I'll throw in hope and engagement as well. <laughs> um, hope came up a lot over the conference, which, which I appreciate. Engagement is something we all think about and talk about. I'll talk about it in a slightly different way, but I really think that those four go together. Now, as I walked through um, my experience at the conference, I learned a lot. And there was a lot to condense and consolidate. So what I'm trying to do is leave you with four words. Strengths, hope, engagement, well-being. And then one thought, those are good. <laughs> so if we can, on campuses, um, identify and develop strengths, if we can promote hope, if we can get students more engaged, if we can bump up their well-being, we're golden. Okay? So when you think about this whole big field of positive psychology, all that we know in higher education, all that we're learning to apply in behavioral economics about student choice, think about all that stuff. It's a lot of reading, it's a lot of different programs, it's a lot of different opinions, but I think this is what it boils down to. Strengths, hope, engagement, and well-being. I'm going to unpack that a little bit, I'm going to kind of paint off some things that have been discussed um, throughout the last two days and hopefully make sense out of uh, these four uh, constructs. I am feeling a little bit under the weather when I'm wearing my green cape. <laughs> James left it for me before he left, so it's kind of tucked in. Um, but hopefully, uh, if, again, if you can't hear me back there, just let me know and I'll, I'll try to um, speak a little louder. Um, those folks who have to catch a plane and will miss the best 10 minutes of my presentation at the very end, um, here are the takeaways. Open engagement and well-being matter. They matter and they constitute a trifecta of positive student outcomes. They matter and they constitute a trifecta of positive student outcomes. I have to admit I was raised at the racetrack um, by my grandfather. It was an illegal dirt track in South Louisiana. On Friday nights, my grandma would take me to the illegal poker game that she ran. I was actually Cajun Bure, so it's a Cajun form of poker. And then my grandfather would take me to um, the rooster fights on Saturday. And then the whole family would go to the racetrack on Sunday. Very good feeling activity. That's where I learned the term trifecta. <laughs> um, so I'm betting on a college student trifecta here, um, where hope, engagement, and well-being kind of went out they are things that we're focused on, we're betting on them every time, and we want them to go win places show every time for our students. Um, strengths drive hope, engagement, and well-being. So there's no magic elixir, there's no magic wand, there's no silver bullet, there's none of this stuff. However, strengths helps with hope, building strengths helps with engagement, building strengths helps with well-being. So if we're looking for that one thing to turn the dial on those other three, then strengths might be it. Engagement actually has an interesting relationship with well-being, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Hope, um, if you take hope and optimism, put them together, um, we just did this in a sample of about 360 students, um, you can predict 70% of the variance in well-being. 70% of the variance. So we did a structural equation model with college students, all kinds of fancy stats. Basically, hope and optimism are distinct, yet related, and they predict 70% of the variance in well-being. So they have to be, it has to be part of the equation. Hope out predicted optimism, and I always love to say that. Hope out predicted optimism. Um, campuses can cultivate positive psychology. It is as easy as changing a light bulb. Okay, let's talk about how easy that is. Compact fluorescent light bulbs. Who's heard of them? Low curly cute light bulbs? Raise your hand high if you've heard of them. Okay, very good. All right, raise your hand. Hi, if you know they're good for the environment, except for disposal. Okay. Okay. Raise your hand again if you bought one. All right. Okay. So now we know it's a good idea. We know it's good for the environment. Okay. Home Depot will recycle them for free. All right. Take your compact fluorescence. Ten years from now, when it burns out, that one you bought, bring it over to Home Depot give it to them, they will recycle it for free. So you don't have to worry about kind of the, 
the gases that are caught up in the light bulb. Okay? Tom Friedman and other folks, they convinced us this is a good thing. Now, so we should all have, I'm going to say 75% of our light bulbs at home changed over to CFLs. Raise your hand if 75% or more of your light bulbs are changed over to CFLs. Okay, if you look around, the number cut in half. Dropped off, big time. Everybody knows about them. Most people think they're a good idea. Everybody's bought at least one. Only half of those folks have really changed. Why is that? It's a good idea. We know about it. Not too expensive. But we haven't converted to CFLs. Any guesses why? Some people don't like the light they put up. Some people don't like the light they give off. And that's a brand issue. <coughs> when you look across brands, um, if you buy just three different brands, there's one of the three that will be closer to the light that you're accustomed to. So I went through that phase too. The, I, I'm kind of live in the dark, my wife says. I have one lamp in my study and six windows. So at night, there's one lamp. And I do everything by that one lamp. And I had this bluish light, and I just didn't like it. Um, but I changed brands. I got the right tone and, 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 and uh, ambiance I was looking for. What's another reason we don't change? We're cognitively conservative. We're cognitively conservative. Can you say more about that? I love that. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to change an initial set of things you know or think about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love this. OK, let's add to that. <laughs> well, mine is you still have the old kind left, and you don't want to waste them. Well, sure. we got to trot out that old light bulb because we don't want to waste that 59 cents. We don't want to give it to Goodwill. We don't want to give it to Salvation Army. Man, we got it. We don't want to. We don't want to use it for target practice. Um, we don't want something different. It's not what we're accustomed to. Um, we're cognitively conservative. We've got some of the old stuff. Isn't that kind of what? we talk about when we're changing our university. It's, it's a little bit different, you know? Dare I say new aging, you know? People may say it's kind of fluffy to have those CFLs in my house. Oh, you're going green. I hate people who go green, you know? <laughs> um, then there's the issue of, I've got some old stuff I gotta try out. You know, we've got a bunch of program books. This program doesn't work. But we ordered 200 books. We got 50 left. We got it. What, what are we going to do if we don't use these books? And then we're cognitively conservative. We operate by a status quo bias. It's how we manage the world. So much stuff is coming in. You learn so much stuff in the last two days. But then when you go back to campus, you're thinking, well, my stuff's OK. And I'm going to stay the same. I was influenced a little bit, but I'm going to stay the same. Because it's hard. It's hard to incorporate new ideas, change old ideas, and move. So this, that thinking comes out of a lot of different literatures, but most famously out of Kahneman's uh, studies on um, looking at uncertainty in our lives and figuring out how to frame uh, ideas for change and then moving forward. We're dealing with a lot of uncertainty on our campuses. Our campuses, our students are dealing with a lot of uncertainty. And I think now more than ever, we may be scared to change the light bulbs. Okay, but that's exactly what I'm going to encourage you to do. Now I'm going to talk about 1,100,000 and 11 students. First student is mine, he's a preschooler. The next 10 are 10 students who were um, on academic probation at the University of Kansas. They were in the course called Simon Success. When you're near failure, let's call the course student success, <laughs> and that will make it okay. Um, so they're in that course. Um, so I'll talk about my chats with them, and then I'll talk about uh, the data we have on 100,000 fifth through 12th graders and how it relates to you on campuses, and then I'll talk about the million students that we're surveying <coughs> uh, next month. So let's start with the preschooler. Um, it's in my son's contract that I get to use three slides of him being cute. Um. <laughs>